The Crystal Pool by Jack Trelawney. Chapter 1. Are we nearly there yet? Are we nearly there yet? moaned Louis for the twelfth time. Stop asking that, scolded Tizzy. You are nearly eight, you know. Not long now, said Mr. Bennet, smiling patiently. Anastasia Bennet was called Tizzy for short. She was nearly eleven years old, and her brother Louis, who always had to tell people how to say his name, Louis, not Louis, when he first met them, was seven and three quarters. The Bennet family were going on holiday in their car. As they passed over the long bridge that spanned the river Tamar, there was a sign which had two words on it, Cornwall and Kerno. Kerno is the old Cornish language name for Cornwall, explained Mr. Bennet. We'll soon be in the town of Newquay, which was once called Town Blistra. My dad knows everything, thought Tizzy. Yes, and my friend Todd said there are real gnomes in Cornwall, enthused Louis. They live in people's gardens and come alive at night. And there are trolls and sea monsters and little people called piskies that only children can see. My brother doesn't know anything, thought Tizzy. Be a good girl and amuse your brother for a while, said Mum, handing her daughter a booklet. Here, show him all about the Eden Project. We're going there tomorrow morning. Look at these two huge white domes, Louis, said Tizzy, pointing at the front page of the booklet. Louis looked as Tizzy continued. They're so big that one has a jungle in it and the other has a desert. Louis was puzzled. How can they have a jungle and a desert in them? Because the scientists make it so that the climate is like a real jungle in one dome and like a desert in the other, explained Tizzy. What's a climate? queried Louis. It's the weather and temperature in a particular place, answered Tizzy. It's warm and wet in the jungle and hot and dry in the desert. Louis gave her one of his confused looks. But where do they get the plants? They collect them from all over the world and put them in the big white domes to live, said Tizzy. They've even brought back carnivorous plants from some places. What's carnivorous? asked Louis, screwing up his face because he'd never heard that word before. It means meat eating, answered his sister. If you get too close, they'll eat you, Louis. They like eating little boys. No way! shrugged Louis, pretending not to be bothered. Stop frightening your brother, Tizzy, cautioned Mum. You know he has nightmares. Tizzy went quiet, reading all about the Eden Project for the rest of the journey. Louis was quiet too. He was thinking about carnivorous plants and wondering whether they really could eat people. Chapter 2 Echo Cave. An hour after crossing the Tamar Bridge, the Bennets arrived at the hotel and parked the car. When they were unpacked, Mrs. Bennet asked them what they wanted to do first. Beach, said Tizzy. Beach, said Louis. Beach, said Dad. Beach it is then, said Mum, with a big smile. Mrs. Bennet made sure they had everything ready. The surfboard, the blow-up shark, Louis's float, the big towels and the picnic basket. Then she picked up her little red beach bag and led the way to the front of the hotel. On the short walk to the beach, Louis looked at the seagulls. Tizzy listened to the roar of the sea. Dad smelt the fish and chips. And Mum admired the wonderful view over the bay. When they arrived at the beach, Louis and Tizzy changed into their swimming costumes and asked if they could go exploring before they went in the water. All right, but make sure you can see us all the time, warned Dad. Race, shouted Tizzy, and set off running towards a big cave with Louis chasing after her. Tizzy was a very good big sister, and she slowed down a little so that she and Louis both got to the mouth of the cave at exactly the same time. For some reason, though, Tizzy was hesitant to go any further. She had a strange feeling that something was wrong. As usual, Louis just went straight in, with neither thought nor feeling to hinder his progress. 
Come out of there, Louis, pleaded Tizzy. Dad said we must be able to see them all the time. I can see Mum and Dad from in here, reported Louis, from atop a pointed rock towards the back of the cave, his words echoing around the walls to his obvious delight. Come in and stand on this rock, and you'll see I'm telling the truth. Or are you scared? Despite her own reservations, and although she thought Dad might be cross, Tizzy made herself go into the cave. She was determined not to be called a scaredy cat by her little brother. He'd definitely go on about it for the whole holiday if she didn't go in. On braving the cave, Tizzy saw Louis's pointed rock, which was covered in seaweed and surrounded by a little pool. Drips of water plopped into the pool from the roof of the cave, making ripples as they splashed. She put her toe in the water and immediately took it out. I can't do that. It's freezing, she complained. Close your eyes and it doesn't feel as cold, advised Louis. That's what I did. Tizzy didn't think that closing her eyes would stop the pool being cold, but tried it anyway. She summoned all her courage and stepped into the water. It was just as cold with her eyes closed. She waded five shivering steps to the rock and Louis stretched out his hand to help her climb up it. Tizzy and Louis stood on the big rock, surrounded by the icy cold pool. Pop! Pop! The seaweed covering the rock popped every time they moved their feet. Hello! shouted Louis. Hello! replied the cave. I'm going to call it Echo Cave! declared Louis. OK, agreed his sister. That's a good name. Inside the cave, it was very dark. They both looked out towards the bright and sunny beach. It's like looking out of a tunnel, said Louis. Yes, said Tizzy. And the good thing is, we can still see Mum and Dad. Suddenly, they heard a rustling sound from the back of the cave. Someone, or something, was in there with them. Chapter 3. Gwythian Sand Who's there? whispered Tizzy. It could be a cave monster, exclaimed Louis, as if half hoping it would be. There was another rustling sound at the back of the cave. Tizzy wanted to run away and tell Mum and Dad, but Louis was already clambering over rocks towards the sound. Come back, Louis, she pleaded, but Louis just kept on going, and Tizzy knew she had to follow. Even though they were always arguing, Tizzy loved Louis really, and she couldn't just leave him there, especially if he might be in danger. So she followed her little brother into the darkness and took his hand for comfort as they went further and further and further into the cave. It got darker and darker and colder and colder as they stumbled over wet, slippery rocks. Soon the cave became more like a tunnel with a flat, sandy floor. Whoosh! They heard the faint whistling of wind up ahead. The further in they went, the more the wind gusted down the tunnel towards them, blowing Tizzy's long, fair hair off her ears. Please let's go back, pleaded Tizzy. I'm really scared. Oh, why? protested Louis, his teeth chattering as the wind began to scream and howl and make his swimming shorts flap against his legs. Can't we go on just a little bit further? Boom! Flash! Before they could go on or back another step, there was a loud noise accompanied by a very bright spark of light. They were dazzled for a few moments as a huge puff of yellow smoke began to engulf them. Tizzy and Louie huddled together and shivered in the smoke, gripping each other even more tightly as a voice from the darkness startled them. So sorry, didn't mean to frighten you, just lighting my glow crystal. With that, a little ball of golden light began to glow in the smoke. It was a couple of feet off the ground and shone brightly from a tiny yellow stone held in the upturned palm of a very small hand. The light became even brighter 
allowing them to see who was speaking. It was a diminutive man, not much taller than Louis, with bow legs and extra large ears which stuck out at the sides of his long, grey, bushy beard. He wore a monocle in his right eye and squinted at them through it. Who are you? asked Tizzy. What are you? asked Louis. A pisky? I most certainly am not, replied the little man, apparently offended. Troublesome little things, piskies. Let me introduce myself. I am Gwythian Sand, the king's chief surveyor and map maker. As the man spoke, he gave a little bow. But we have a queen, not a king at the moment, quizzed Tizzy suspiciously. Yes, that's right, the Queen of Cornwall, spouted Louis, as if he knew something important. My brother really doesn't know anything at all, thought Tizzy. Aha, but I am not from Cornwall, explained Mr Sand. I am from the land of Kerno. But they're the same place, complained Tizzy, remembering what her dad had said in the car at the big bridge. Not right. Well, not quite, informed the little man, whose big ears and stubby nose and bushy eyebrows all twitched together as he spoke. Colonel Land is like Cornwall in some ways, but it is altogether a very different place. What's it like? asked Louis enthusiastically. He believed the little man without question, because he wanted to believe. Kerno Land is a place of wonder and magic, enthused Mr Sand with a big, friendly smile. And just where is this Kerno Land supposed to be? queried Tizzy in her most important sounding voice, whilst at the same time trying not to sound rude. And if you live there, what are you doing here? I'm... I... I... I'm just exploring the caves, stuttered Mr Sand as if a bit flummoxed and flustered by Tizzy's tone. Anyway, have to be on my way now. Must get back to Kerno Land. Take this glow crystal, and you will be able to find your way back to the beach. Bye-bye, children. Gwythian Sand turned about and hurried off down the tunnel, waddling as fast as his little legs could carry him. When he neared a bend, he glanced back over his shoulder, as if to make sure they weren't following him then rounded the corner and disappeared out of sight. Chapter 4 The Glistening Cavern Better get back to the beach, Louis, suggested Tizzy, sensibly. I want to go to Colonel Land, insisted Louis. Without giving his sister a chance to reply, he set off in the direction in which Mr Sand had gone. But you've got no light, shouted Tizzy after him. You won't be able to see in the dark. When she caught up with her brother, Tizzy scolded him like she thought big sisters are supposed to. Come back now, Louis. We don't know what's down the tunnel. It could be dangerous. But I just want to see where Kerno Land is, sighed Louis. Please, Tizzy. Please. Tizzy found it hard to say no to her brother when he said please but still tried one last time to reason with him. There is no Kerno Land, Louis. That man made up a story because you're a little boy. Why did he have a crystal that glows in the dark then? countered Louis. Tizzy had to admit that it was quite a good question, and she hadn't actually thought about it herself. Oh, all right. We can go on for a few more minutes, but you'll see... There'll be nothing down that tunnel except more rocks. And don't blame me if you stub your toe on something. Here, you take the light. Louis held the glow crystal in his right hand and lit the way. Tizzy held her brother's left hand again, this time squeezing it just a little as they continued on down the tunnel. After what seemed like ages, they came upon a big open cavern. Tizzy looked around in awe. She had never seen anything like it. The walls were set with glistening stones in all the colours of the rainbow. Louis looked up. It's so high. I can only just see the top. A familiar voice echoed through the cavern 
and attracted their attention to a large recess in the wall. Oh dear me! Look, it's Mr. Sand, exclaimed Tizzy, pointing her finger. The Bennet children stared, transfixed, hardly able to believe their own eyes. Mr. Sand was in a pool of steaming blue liquid. Through a misty blue haze, they saw that only his head was above the surface of the pool. He was looking in their direction, with an expression of great worry on his face, as if concerned that they should see him doing what he was doing. Do you need help, Mr. Sand? shouted Tizzy. Oh dear, oh dear, no, no, no! Go away, children, go away! It's very important that you don't... With that, Mr. Sand's mouth sank into the pool before he could finish his sentence. Chapter 5 The Crystal Pool Louis ran towards Mr. Sand, but by the time he got there, the weird little man's head was completely submerged. Strangely, what had been a pool of blue liquid only moments earlier was now a solid slab of blue rock which sparkled and twinkled even brighter than the cavern walls. Before Tiddy could stop him, Louis was standing on the slab, stamping his foot up and down on the solid stone. How did he disappear into it, Tizzy? It's all hard. I don't know, Louis. Now just get down off there. You can't make me. Oh, yes, I can, young man, admonished Tizzy, in a voice she had heard her mother use so often. She stepped onto the blue slab to try to move Louis off it. Don't be silly, Louis. Let's go back to the beach. I really have had enough of this now. But I want to go to Kerno land, shouted her little brother. At that very instant, the hard blue rock beneath their feet began to hiss. Tizzy screamed and tried to step off it, but the rock was now sticky like glue and her feet were stuck to it. The rock got softer and softer until it was like runny jelly at the top, but still quite firm under their feet. It frothed and bubbled as blue steam rose all around them. The children started to sink. Tizzy and Louie squirmed and wriggled, but they just couldn't stop themselves sinking and sinking. For the first time that afternoon, Tizzy thought Louis looked really scared. As they sank deeper and deeper into the steaming blue pool, Louis whispered something which Tizzy could only just hear. I think I said the password. They were now up to their waist in the bubbling liquid. Tizzy tried to think for both of them. Bend your knees and jump as high as you can and try to grab onto the side and pull yourself up, Louis, she instructed. She tried... Louis tried. Their feet were still stuck to the hard part of the rock. I can't do it. I just can't, shouted Louis, with a look of panic on his face. Whatever you do, Louis, hold your breath for as long as you can, and close your eyes, and pinch your nose like this. Copying Tizzy, Louis put his fingers over his nose and squeezed. His chin started to sink into the rock before Tizzy's because he was shorter than her. I'm scared, he whimpered. Just hold your breath, said Tizzy. Hold your breath! She wasn't quite sure why, but she also said, You're the best brother in the world, Louis. Tizzy watched in horror as her brother's head went under the surface of the steaming, frothing, bubbling blue liquid. She held her breath as it began to cover her chin. A little tear whirled in her eye and she began to cry. <laughs> I don't want us to die. She sobbed quietly. Chapter 6. Still Alive Then, for no apparent reason, the hard part of the rock under their feet began to rise up again. Tizzy emerged from the bubbling, fizzing blue pool before Louis. First the top of her head, then her brow. When her eyes rose above the surface, she opened them and looked around. Just a few more seconds to hold her breath and she would still be alive. <gasps> she gasped as her mouth was once more able to breathe air. She hoped and hoped that Louis would be all right. It seemed like ages that they had been under the surface. Then Louis's head emerged from the pool, followed by the rest of him. The pool began to solidify under their feet, and soon, after a lot more hissing, they were standing on a firm slab of twinkling, sparkling blue rock again. Oh, Louis, you're all right! sighed Tizzy, 
as she put her arms around her brother in a gesture of relief. Yeah, said Louis, nonchalantly, trying to wriggle away from his sister's hug. I didn't know you could hold your breath for so long, Louis. You were in there longer than me. Well done. I can't, admitted Louis. When I couldn't hold my breath any more, I just started breathing. It was easy. Tizzy gave Louis one of her don't be so silly looks, so he changed the subject. Where are we? Do you think this is Kernoland? Shh, said Tizzy, putting her hand over his mouth. That was the word that made us sink into the rock before. They both looked at each other expectantly and got ready to sink again. This time, though, the word didn't have any effect. The rock didn't hiss or steam or get sticky or soft. It just stayed as it was, hard and cold. Tizzy sighed with relief. From the look on his face, she could see that Louis was slightly disappointed. I'd still like to go to Kernoland! He shouted defiantly, as if having one last go at getting there. Look, we're in exactly the same place as before, reasoned Tizzy. The cavern is exactly the same and you've still got the glow crystal. What should we do now? We'll use the glow crystal to get back through the dark tunnel to Echo Cave. Then we can throw the crystal away and go and see Mum and Dad. They're going to be cross that we've been away so long. Yes, so you'd better not tell them about Mr Sand and the glow crystal and the sinking rock. Agreed? Agreed, nodded Louis. He certainly didn't want to get into any more trouble than they were in already. Right, so give me the crystal. As Louis handed over the glowing yellow crystal, Tizzy noticed that its light had got much dimmer. It looks like it might go out soon. We'll have to hurry. They set off down the tunnel back towards the beach. There had been no wind in the high cavern, but for some reason the long tunnel was very windy, just as it had been before. The howling wind pushed them along from behind. They reached Echo Cave just as the light from the glow crystal finally went out. The sunlight streamed in through the cave entrance. Tizzy threw the little crystal over her head towards the back of the cave, where it plopped into the icy cold pool. Right, let's go and see Mum and Dad, she sighed, very relieved to have got back to where they started from. But as they looked out from the cave along the beach, there was no one to be seen. The buckets and spades had gone. The people and towels had gone. The ice cream van had gone. Mum and Dad had gone. Chapter 7. Bumps on the Beach Outside Echo Cave, thunder roared overhead as it began to pour with rain. Heavy droplets pelted down on the rocks. A waterfall soon covered the cave entrance like a big, wet curtain. Tizzy and Louie glimpsed the deserted beach through the torrent of water. Mum and Dad and everyone else must have gone because they thought it was going to rain, said Tizzy, trying to make Louie feel better. But why did they leave us here? worried Louie. Because you're with me and they know I'm old enough to be sensible, reassured Tizzy, not quite sure that she was entirely right. When the rain stops, we can go across the beach and up the cliff steps to the town. The hotel isn't far. OK, agreed Louis. I just want to see Mum and Dad now. While they waited, Louis started asking who, what and why questions. He was always doing that when he was curious or bothered about something, and Tizzy usually dismissed him as much as possible, as if she wasn't really interested in his childish questions. But secretly, with all that had happened, she was now a little bit more interested in finding out the answers herself. Who do you think Mr Sand is, Tizzy? He's probably a Cornish person who likes going in caves and scaring little children like you. But why is he so short? And why did he have such funny clothes? And that funny hat? I think he could be a gnome. Lots of Cornish people are short, and gnomes aren't real. What about the glow crystal? Crystals don't do that on their own. It was probably a toy, something from a joke shop. It might have had a tiny battery somewhere inside it. I'm going to find it again decided Louis, before making his way towards the back of the cave. It was darker there, and he couldn't see too well. He started paddling around the icy pool, trying to find the little yellow crystal with his feet, as he asked more questions. 
What sort of rock do you think that round blue rock is? I don't know, but there are lots of things we don't know. Grown-ups probably know all about them, but we can't ask anyone because you promised not to, didn't you, Louis? We'll look it up on the internet when we get home. But rocks don't go soft, and you can't slide into them, and you can't breathe inside them, and we don't know that for certain, Louis. Let's just wait and see. Come on, the rain has stopped. They stepped out of the cave into the bright sunshine. Look, said Louis, pointing up to the sky. There, flying low and heading for the cliffs, was a huge black bird with a red beak and red feet. They could hear the sound of its wings flapping. It's as big as a horse, exclaimed Tizzy. The sun glared in their eyes, making it difficult to see clearly. Louis wasn't sure, but he thought there was a man riding in a saddle on the bird's back. We have come to another place, Tizzy, he said in amazement. It must be Kernoland. I don't want to talk about it any more, replied Tizzy, not wanting to believe the evidence of her own eyes. What's that? screeched Louis, suddenly grabbing his sister's arm and making her jump. Tizzy looked and saw her brother was pointing at the ground, his finger trembling. All around them, the grains of sand were moving. The beach began to rise up in little bumps. The little bumps turned into bigger bumps. As the bumps grew and grew, a huge pink-red claw rose out of one of them and snapped open and shut. Two large, cold, black eyes followed it. Then a pair of pincers emerged in front of a big mouth. All around them, claws and black eyes and pincers and big mouths were rising out of the sand. Suddenly, the sand right under their feet started to shift and rise up. Run, Louis! shouted Tizzy in terror. They're giant crabs! Chapter 8. The Knotted Rope Tizzy jumped off the rising sand and ran towards the cliff where the steps had been. Louis followed as fast as he could. Behind them, the giant crabs were now completely out of the sand and chasing them up the beach. The crabs moved sideways, snapping their claws and making a squeaking noise with their pincers as they moved them in and out. Louis glanced behind him. The crabs were opening and shutting their red mouths, which dripped with a gooey liquid as if they were hungry. Ah! Louis cried out. Tizzy looked behind her to see Louis sitting on the sand clutching his foot. It was bleeding. He had tripped and fallen about halfway to the cliff. A tear welled in his eye as the blood trickled between his fingers. Help me, Tizzy, he shouted. I've cut my foot on a shell. Louis tried to get up. In his haste, he slipped on the sand again and fell back down. Tizzy ran to help him. She now saw that lots of blood was oozing from the cut. Tizzy put Louis's arm around her shoulders and helped him get to his feet. He began to hop up the beach towards the cliff, with Tizzy helping him as much as she could. But the two of them were going much slower now. The crabs were gaining ground and catching up with every second. Tizzy heard the snapping of the claws and the squeaking of the pincers getting nearer. Faster, Louis! We must go faster! Finally, they got to the part of the cliff where the steps had been. Where are the steps? whimpered Louis. They've gone! We'll have to climb up instead, urged Tizzy, as she began to scramble up the cliff. Come on, Louis! Louis reached out his hands and put his good foot on the rock. Then he took hold and pulled himself up and put his bad foot down on it. Ouch! Tizzy heard Louis cry out as she continued up the cliff. Quicker, Louis! We must climb higher to get out of reach of the crabs! I'm trying, but my foot hurts! Here, take my hand, offered Tizzy, stretching out her arm. As her brother took her left hand, Tizzy held on tightly with her right and pulled as hard as she could. It was lucky she did, because a giant crab was just about to snap its claws onto Louis's leg. Clunk! The claws came together with a crunch. When this crab missed clamping onto Louis's leg, it seemed to give up and just lay down at the bottom of the cliff face. Tizzy was relieved to see that the crabs weren't trying to get them anymore. But then she saw that a second giant crab climbed onto the back of the first, and a third climbed onto the back of the second. Tizzy couldn't believe it. The giant crab seemed to be building a piggyback tower in order to reach them. As long as we can climb up and get to the top, we'll be okay, she assured Louis, although her whole body was shaking with fear as she continued to climb in panic. 
Glancing down, she saw that the crabs were only inches away from Louis's feet. Faster, Louis! Climb faster! I'm trying! Just then, a thick rope with lots of knots along it flopped down beside them. Someone shouted from the top of the cliff. Hold on, children. We'll soon have you out of there. Grab the rope, Louis! screamed Tizzy as she grabbed hold of it herself without really thinking. I've got it! shouted Louis from below. Pull us up! Please! Please! screamed Tizzy. The rope started to move upwards, with the two children hanging on tightly. They were halfway to the top of the cliff before Tizzy thought of something which she whispered down to Louis as quietly as she could. We don't know who it is up there. Chapter 9 Melancholy Drim and Spiky As they neared the top of the cliff, Tizzy became more and more worried about who was pulling on the other end of the rope. When they reached the top, the last bit was grassy and her head was suddenly being dragged through the grass, forcing her to close her eyes. When she opened them, she saw who had been pulling on the rope. It was a man with grey skin and a horrible smirk on his face. Run, Louis! Run! But the tall, skinny man had long, gangly arms, and he grabbed them both by the ears with his grey, bony fingers as they tried to get away. Louis by his left ear, and Tizzy by her right. He lifted his hands up so that they both had to stand on tiptoe to stop it hurting so much. Ah! What have we here, Dribble? He sneered to his dog. Kids with golden hair. I've never seen the like of these two before. They'll likely fetch a good price at the slave market. Pigleg will pay handsomely for them, I'm sure. Oh, yes, he will. Grr, growled Dribble, as if he disapproved of what was happening. The man snarled and kicked the poor little dog with his pointed shoes. The dog yelped and cowered submissively. Tizzy hoped the man would not hurt the little dog again. Yes, very good price, said the man, menacingly, bringing his long pointed nose right in front of Tizzy's face. He stared at her with his cold, dark, bloodshot eyes, and she was so scared she began to sob. Louis saw that the man was frightening his big sister. He tried to be brave. Let her go! He shouted in his deepest voice as he tried to kick the man in the shins and punch him in the tummy. But the man just pulled on Louis's ear a little harder and he had to stop kicking and punching because it really hurt. Let us go, please, begged Tizzy. We haven't done anything wrong. All children have done something wrong. Oh, yes, they have, growled the man as he dragged them screaming towards a track that was a few yards from the cliff edge. Tizzy saw that one way... The track led down to a little town of round houses with thatched, cone-shaped roofs. A sign pointing in that direction showed that it was Town Blistra. The other way, the track went around a hill which rose above the cliff, so she couldn't see what was on the other side. Tizzy looked at the man's rickety wooden cart. Harnessed at the front was a scruffy-looking brown horse. The back of the cart was filled with all sorts of rubbish. The man pointed to a pile of rotten old rags. Get in there and put those clothes on, he said. Out here in this weather in your underwear? Whatever next? Don't want you to get sick, do we? Oh, no, we don't. Want you in prime condition for the market? Oh, yes, we do. Tizzy and Louie didn't move. You'll do as I say, or you'll feel the wrath of Spiky. Oh, yes, you will, growled the man. They both looked at the pointed stick that the man was wielding. Tizzy nodded to Louis that she thought it best to do as they were told. The man grinned another horrible grin. That's better. They don't like the look of you, do they, Spiky? <laughs> oh, no, they don't. When Tizzy and Louis had chosen and put on their smelly old rags, the man clicked thick iron rings around their ankles and turned a big key in the locks. They were now securely shackled to the cart. The stench of the rubbish was horrible. The man tore off some strips from other old clothes in the pile. He rolled the strips up, climbed on the cart, and tied Louis's hands together. Then he put the middle of one strip in Louis's mouth and tied the two ends behind his head. Louis's foot was still bleeding. 
He was trembling, and Tizzy felt very protective towards her little brother. Please don't put that on him, sir. We promise to be quiet, she pleaded. Huh. Kids always make promises they don't keep, he sneered. Do you think I was born yesterday, little lady? Well, I wasn't. Oh, no, I wasn't. As he tied Tizzy's hands together and put a gag in her mouth, she noticed for the first time that the man smelt worse than the rubbish in his cart. The man got out of the cart and wagged his long, thin, dirty-nailed finger at them threateningly. No one will know you're in there unless you make a sound. So, if you make so much as a mouse squeak, I promise you, you'll get to know Spikey a whole lot better. And Melancholy Drim always keeps his promises. Oh, yes, he does. At that very moment, thunder roared overhead and lightning flashed as the storm started anew. Tizzy's eyes met Louis's. She tried to reassure him with her gaze, but she could see he was petrified. Then a big canvas cover was pulled over the back of the cart, and they were in darkness. Chapter 10. The Polpero Inn They travelled on and on through the night. The rain pelted down on the cover, and one of the big wheels of the cart squeaked on every turn so they couldn't even get a minute of sleep. Tizzy could feel the changes in direction as the cart went around bends and rattled up and down hills. Occasionally it bumped and banged over cobbles, which made her think they might be going through towns as well as countryside. When the rain stopped, she hoped she might hear someone friendly, but all was quiet. There was not so much as a whisper from outside, and Tizzy started to think they were never going to escape. She didn't want to be a slave. Questions raced through her mind. Where were they being taken? Who was Pigleg? It seemed like the smelly, rickety old wooden cart had been going on forever before they rattled over hundreds of cobbles as they bumped and banged down a steep hill. Tizzy heard the sound of lots of people who seemed to be having some sort of party. The noise got louder and louder as they approached the bottom of the hill. The cart stopped and Tizzy could now hear that the people were shouting and singing at the top of their voices. Inside the cart, under the cover, it had been pitch black all the way, but Tizzy could now just see through a tiny hole that there were flickering lights outside. She heard Melancholy Drim jump from the front of the cart. His heels clicked on the cobbles as he strode slowly round to the back. The nasty man lifted the cover. A flaming torch in his hand lit up his greasy black hair and horrible grey face. Tizzy had to squint because the light was so bright. Right, let's get you out of there, he said coldly as he threw back the cover, climbed on the cart and turned the key in the shackles around their ankles. We'll get them sold off quickly tonight, Dribble. Oh, yes, we will. Lots of crews in port. Oh, yes, there are. Ten crowns apiece we'll get for golden-haired children. Oh, yes, we will. Leaving their hands tied and gags on, Drim pulled them by their ears again to make them stand up. Tizzy winced as she was forced to her feet. She can now see where the lights were coming from. There was a sign over the door. The Paul Perro Inn. Drim forced them down off the cart and dragged them across the cobbles, pulling roughly on their ears all the while. Heel, Dribble, growled the grey man, pointing to the back of his dirty black shoe. The little sausage dog did as he was told. They went under an arch and round to the back of the inn. Here, Drim discarded his torch and gave three strange knocks as if it were some sort of signal. A fat, rosy-cheeked woman came to the door carrying a lantern. She wore a low-cut blouse and a full-length skirt, which dropped down to her ankles. Tizzy thought she looked like someone from 300 years ago, or even more. Why, Mr. Drim, what brings you all the way to Polpero at such a late hour? Questioned the woman, in such a manner that Tizzy thought she already knew the answer. Good evening, Mrs. Maggot, said Drim as he tugged on Tizzy and Louie's ears so they came into the light of the lantern at the door. 
I'm seeking the opinion of a ship's captain as to the value of two small animals I have for sale. Use your share for you and Mr. Maggot, of course. Oh, well, you should have said sooner, said Mrs. Maggot, grinning greedily, eyeing Tizzy and Louie as if she were hungry and just about to eat her dinner. You don't often see golden hair like that in Colonel Lamb, Mr. Drim. They look to me like angles from east of the Tamar. What are you doing with them? Washed up on the beach. Oh, yes, I did, said Drim, as he dragged Tizzy and Louie into the back room of the inn. I saved them from the climbing crabs, and now they're going to repay me. Oh, yes, they are. Tizzy didn't like the look of Mrs. Maggot any more than she liked Drim, but she was desperate and tried to ask for help. Mm, mm. But the sound came out all muffled by the gag in her mouth. Melancholy Drim glared down at her and nodded to the pointed stick that was stuck in his belt. Remember, I have Spiky with me at all times. Oh, yes, I have. Tizzy wanted to hold Louis's hand to give him some comfort. He seemed to have given up now and was just looking at the ground all the time. She looked at the ground too, so as not to give their captors any reason to hurt them. Mrs Maggot led them through another dark room with her lantern. Then she opened another door, and suddenly they were in the main room of the inn, which had a very low ceiling and exposed timber beams. Tizzy choked a little, and raised her head in the dimly lit, smoke-filled room. All the noise and talking and singing stopped, a fire crinkled and crackled in the corner. Everyone was staring at them. They looked like pirates. Chapter 11. Slaves. What have we here, Mrs. Maggot? Asked a stout man wearing a big apron with bloodstains all over it. Tizzy thought he looked like a butcher. Why, Mr. Maggot, we've some small creatures for sale, property of Mr. Melancholy Drim, said his wife. Well, well, what a pleasant surprise on this dull evening. Bring them forward so we can all assess their value. Some of the people moved the tables to the side, leaving only one chair in the middle of the room. All the people now formed a circle around the chair. The noise got louder as the excitement grew. Drim needed no further encouragement. He pulled Tizzy and Louie forward by their ears and removed Tizzy's gag and ties, throwing them to Dribble, who caught them in his mouth. Drim then pushed Tizzy into the centre. Ladies first, he sneered. Stand on that chair! Tizzy did as she was told. She looked at the floor, quivering from her head to her toes. A pirate with a bald head rose to his feet and paced slowly over to the chair. He was a very big man, with rippling muscles bulging underneath his shirt. He was a foot taller than Tizzy, even though she was standing on the chair. His left arm stopped at the elbow, and there was a piece of wood that looked like a truncheon attached to the stump. Ah, Mr Cudgel, delighted to see you again groveled Drim, rubbing his grey hands together and stooping a little. I trust Captain Pigleg as well. Please inspect the goods at your leisure. Cudgel sneered down at Drim as if he was something nasty and smelly stuck to his shoe. He pulled Tizzy's chin up roughly with a thick finger on his right hand. Tizzy noticed that his little finger was missing, but all the other fingers had silver rings on them. Then, Mr. Cudgel put his face so close to hers that she could smell his bad breath. He was chewing something brown that smelt a bit like cigarettes. He pulled her mouth open. Fancy set of pearls, he mumbled, as if surprised at how nice and clean and white Tizzy's teeth were. Put your tongue out, slave. Tizzy put her tongue out. Then, Mr. Cudgel squeezed her arms. Not much muscle. No use in the cave land mines this one. Wouldn't last a week. Oh, but Mr Cudgel, look at that golden hair and pretty face, snivelled Drim in a worried voice. She'd make a wonderful wife for the Sultan of Sandland. Hmm, that's true enough, mused Mr Cudgel. The captain will be pleased with the purchase, I'm sure. I don't want to be married, protested Tizzy as she began to cry. 
I just want to go home. Everyone in the room roared with laughter. <laughs> it speaks back, bellowed Mr. Cudgel above the noise. <laughs> we'll have to put a stop to that before we can sell her on. <laughs> Melancholy Drim glared at Tizzy. Speak when you're spoken to, slave, he spat drawing Spiky from his belt and resting its rusty iron point on the floor. Tizzy knew this wasn't a game. She looked at the floor again. Four more men and one woman came up to inspect her. They patted and prodded and pinched her. They looked in her eyes, pulled her ears and squeezed her nose. Drim glared all the while. Tizzy kept quiet. Then Mr Maggot sat down at a table, picked up a pewter mug and banged it three times. All fell silent. Right then, ladies and gentlemen. As you can see, we have here what appears to be a fine female specimen of Angle Young. She'd not be much use in the mines, but she'd make a fine lady's maid in the castles of Mountainland. So, let's start the bidding at five crowns, shall we? Five crowns, shouted someone from the back. Tizzy could just see who had spoken. It was a big, fat woman smoking a long, thin pipe. Six, said a man with one ear. Seven, shouted a man with an eye patch. The bidding went on. It got to ten crowns. <laughs> Eleven, bellowed Mr Cudgel. There were no more bids. Tizzy didn't want to be sold to Mr Cudgel. There was something very menacing about him. She was in a daze. Everything had become too much for her. Sold to Mr. Clubworthy Cudgel for eleven crowns, she heard Mr. Maggot say as he banged the mug down on the table very loudly. Mr. Cudgel dropped a bag of coins on the table, grabbed Tizzy's arm, tugged her off the chair and dragged her towards the door. Tizzy suddenly came to her senses. She hadn't thought that she and Louis might be separated. What about my brother? she pleaded. He's only little and he's frightened. <laughs> <laughs> Best you forget about him, warned Mr Cudgel. <laughs> You'll not be seeing him again, I'll wager. As Cudgel reached the door, Tizzy heard Mr Maggot shout out to the pirates. Right then, the next item for sale is a young male angle. Looks like he'll grow into a strong slave for the mines of Caveland, or perhaps an ice carrier in Snowland. Do I have a bid of five crowns? Louis glanced across at Tizzy. She could see the fear in his eyes. Be brave, Louis, she shouted, as she was hauled out roughly into the darkness of the night. Chapter 12. Big Red Grunter. Mr Cudgel pulled Tizzy along through the pouring rain. The sharp stones on the ground hurt her feet, and she kept stumbling. Come on, Missy, said the big man impatiently. You'll have to toughen up where you're going. Tizzy had at first thought they were heading towards the harbour, where there were a few boats moored. But Mr Cudgel had dragged her up some steep steps, and they were now travelling along a cliff path in the opposite direction. As they rounded a bend in the path, Tizzy saw a ship out to sea in the distance, its silhouette lit up by the moon. She didn't want to go on a ship. She wanted to go back to be with Louis. Please, sir, she asked, trying to be nice so that he would give her an answer. Where are you taking me? And, and, who is Captain Pigleg? Suddenly, Mr Cudgel flew into a rage. He shook Tizzy by the shoulders and threw her to the ground. As she lay there, petrified on the sandy path, thunder roared in the distance. Lightning flashed as Mr Cudgel pointed a thick finger at her and curled his lip. You'll speak when you're spoken to, slave, he snarled. The captain will teach you some manners with a lash and no mistake. I'm sorry, I'll be good, promised Tizzy, trying to pacify the big, angry man. She didn't like the sound of the lash, which was a sort of whip as far as she knew. That's better growled Mr Cudgel, heaving Tizzy to her feet. Now, let me tell you about Captain Pigleg, so as you know the man who's to be your new master, and you can show him some respect. He's the toughest, bravest, 
meanest pirate ever to sail the seas. You'll be wondering why they call him Pigleg, won't you? Well, the captain had made port in Jungle Land, see? Then he went a strolling on a path near the jungle after visiting the local inn. Suddenly, out of the dark shadowy trees, a wild boar moved onto the path, grunting and sniffing and itching for battle. The captain could see straight away it was the one the jungle landers call Big Red Grunter, on account of his being thrice the size of any other boar in the jungle, with a hide redder and blood. Any other man would have been a dead man from sheer fear. But the captain drew his cutlass and challenged the brute. Come and taste my steel, Red Grunter, and I'll be eating your flesh roar for breakfast in the morning. Grunter put his head down and charged the captain. There was a terrible fight. The beast has four long tusks and teeth like razors. In one bite it chewed off the captain's leg just below the knee, and the captain fell to the ground. But the captain was not going to die that night. Not he. As the monster moved in for the kill, the captain swung his cutlass and hacked away the pig's own front leg with one mighty swipe. Grunter let out a squeal to wake the very night itself and hopped off back into the jungle. At daybreak, the search party found the captain lying in a pool of blood. He had his cutlass in one hand and Big Red's leg in the other. When the captain awoke and saw he had no leg, he knew what he had to do. A leg for a leg, thought he. So the captain cut off the flesh and made a peg leg from the blood-stained bone, with the beast's hoof still on the end of it. From that day on, he was known as Captain Pigleg, and you can hear him coming by the click of his hoof on the ground, every second step. And that's the legend that everybody in Kernoland and the whole of Earthworld knows, except you, it seems. Tizzy's eyes opened as wide as they would go, and she thought for a few moments about what she had just learned. She risked another question. Can I ask what happened to Grunter, sir? Ah, well, that's another story. The beast has become a mad thing. It terrorises the villages all over jungle land. Hates humankind. Eats people whenever it can. And it specially likes taking the young children. The tender meat. But Grunter doesn't kill them quickly. No. He drags them into the jungle. And eats them slowly. Bit by bit. By it. That's why there is such a huge bounty on that great red boar. The king chief of Jungle Land himself has offered a whole chest of treasure to whoever brings him its head. Captain Pigleg has made a vow to kill Big Red, whatever it takes. We're leaving on an expedition to Jungle Land in the morning, taking a full cargo of bait, the juiciest child meat we've been able to find around the world this past year. <laughs> and that's where you come in, my little one. You're going to be boar bait. Tizzy went quiet, thinking deeply about everything Mr Cudgel had told her. She could almost feel Big Red Grunter's teeth ripping and tearing at her flesh. They carried on along the path through the rain until descending some steps hewn out of the rocks in a small cove. The waves pounded against the rocks and crashed onto the beach. A little boat was on the sand. Mr Cudgel put Tizzy in the boat and pushed it into the water before jumping in himself. Slotting his truncheon arm into a special hole in one of the oars and gripping the other with his good hand, he began to row towards the ship. He didn't say another word. Tizzy decided to stay silent until spoken to. The dark shadow of the ship loomed ever larger as they drew closer with each stroke of the oars. As they approached, Tizzy could just make out the letters written on the side of the hull. The Revenger. 
A rope ladder dropped down over the side of the ship. Mr Cudgel waved his truncheon arm, motioning to Tizzy to climb up. She did as she was told. Looking up towards a light that shone over the side of the boat, she saw a man with a lantern peering down at her. It was then that Tizzy heard the muffled cries of frightened children. Help us! Please help us!